to read Back to Reality, the best-selling novel of the bestseller experiment by the two marks, go to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash back to reality. And subscribe to this podcast to get loads of extra bonuses. Go to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash subscribe. Sherilyn Kenyon, welcome to the Bestseller Experiment. How are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. Thank you so much for having me on. Our absolute pleasure. You've had an incredible year. A bestseller on the New York Times, Publishers Weekly, a USA Today bestselling author. Um, but it hasn't always been that way, has it? How did how did it all start out for you? Oh, sadly. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. Um, you know, just like anybody else, I guess, a lot of hard work, a lot of, you know, ups and downs and life should always be easy, right? <laughs> I want to tell my kids, enjoy it now. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, One thing I was interested in noting was you did a lot of firsts. You were one of the first people to have an e-book published by a company called Dreams Unlimited. And I'm always fascinated to hear from people who were there at the beginning of the e-book revolution. Because, you know, as William Goldman said about the movie industry, and I think this applies just as much to the uh, publishing industry, nobody knows anything. So what made you dive into e-books? What did you see about that that made you think, yes, I want to be a part of that? <laughs> well, you know, I I was a web developer back before really anybody knew what the web was. It just, it, it was a natural progression, I think, because I always loved technology and I, I had such an early embrace on it. I worked for the government back in the 80s and was online before anybody really knew, you know, working internet for the army. And So, you know, that was before it had gone commercial and before people had really heard of it. And so the minute that it started breaking out for commercial use, it was like, hey, guys, this is what I was telling you all about. Cool. (laughs) And then Nate and then Nate. And uh, yeah, it was just electronic. The the idea of being able to carry 100 books in your pocket. I mean, is this not really the dream of all writers or not writers, but readers. So, you know, yeah, I, I still love books. I mean, I don't think we'll ever be able to replace a real book, but just that, that ability to be able to have research at your fingertips, what, what a concept. And you talk about um, being a pioneer in the internet as well, because you, you were dabbling, well, I don't, you're obviously doing it as, as, as a professional as well. You're working on the internet back in the 80s. It's like you say, before it was something that was even, it was the kind of stuff of science fiction almost. And in 1994, you were the first female author to set up a website. Tell us about that experience. Oh, that was not, you know, that was notepad. That was, hey, we have to type <laughs> out everything. Yeah, not, not fun. That was more frustrating than anything. But yeah, yeah, it was just, you know, and oh, dial up modem days. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody knew what I was even talking about back then trying to explain it. So, yeah, but it, it was just it started out just kind of fun. I mean, because I had done it with the government and, you know, yeah, you were telnetting in and setting it up. And, you know, yeah, it just to me, being on that cutting edge just was so cool. And, yeah, you know, I, I can still remember the first time I heard sound online <laughs> You know, or or you actually had a real picture go up. You're like, oh, my God, (laughs) look, you know, you felt like that that moment. Oh, I guess it was probably what my mother felt like the first time she saw a movie in color, you know, or had TV in the house. You know, this is a miracle. (laughs) I just read a book uh, called Factfulness in which the author, he's sadly passed away, but he, he talks about the first time that his mother got a, a washing machine and they'd done it by hand up till that point. And they, right, they, they put it yeah. in the house and they sat and watched it go through a whole <laughs> cycle, just sat there in front of the washing machine, did the right. whole cycle, spin dry and everything. And then they took the clothes out and his mother took his hand and said, we're going to put it on again. And then you and I are going to go to the library, which is yeah. such a lovely, <laughs> it just yeah. shows you how this technology frees you up to do these things. But for you, what, I mean, your website now is incredible. I mean, it's, I just, for researching the interview, it's, it's, um, it puts, all other authors' websites to shame because it has all your books, not only in series order, but also you can sort it by publication order. You can, there's extensive FAQs and history about you. Um, you've obviously got a massive fan base who wants to know all about you. Is that how the website came about? You interacting with your readers? 
Uh, basically, you know, it, it just it, and I spend way too much time on it. <laughs> <laughs> she has no life. Um, yeah, it, it just, you know, things where where, you know, because I, I've worked on them for so long for other people. It's an amalgamation of what do you do for corporate sites? You know, what, what are people coming to these things for? You know, I, I've worked on a lot of sites for Hollywood because I've built them out for all these different other entities. So it's like, okay, what did we find useful for those sites? So I try to come at it. What do the people I was building them for and talking to the fans themselves, you know, what questions are they most asking about? Well, we then we need to add that to the website and, you know, just trying to be as helpful for them as I can. Fantastic. Now, for a a writer listening to this, if maybe they're setting up the website for the first time or they have a website and they don't really know what to do with it, what would you say are the essentials for a good basic author website? Well, learn, really learn to do it for yourself. I mean, because if if you try and and, and outsource it, it's going to get expensive real fast. You know, my kids are, are writing their books for the first time. And that's one thing I keep hammering home to them. Son, learn web development. And like, Mom, that's what I have you for. Yes, but your mom's getting older, kid. I'm not going to be around forever. So really pick up the reins, kid. You're going you're gonna to need this. Uh, yeah, lesson one is always really, if it's nothing but WordPress, learn to do it for yourself. It's an investment of time, well worth the effort. But, you know, make sure that you've got a bio, keep it current. And okay, I'm not always the most current with that. And I know that, you know, the one page I always forget to go and update. Try and keep the bio current as you can. Make sure that you have the latest information up there about the books. Make sure you've got your buy links working. You know, the, those are the, the basics that you really, really need to keep current. Fantastic. Now, one thing I notice when looking at your books, um, many of the series that you write are registered trademarks, which is absolutely fascinating to me. And it's not something you see many authors do. Why did you register them as trademarks and and what was involved? Well, the main reason is because I have children. You know, a copyright will only survive the author plus 70, 75 years, and then it goes into public domain. Mm -hmm. And that's all well and good if you have no children. You don't really care what happens to them. But because I have children, you know, everything I've done has been for my boys. And with a trademark, a trademark lasts as long as you're maintaining your trademark. And, you know, I I want my children and my grandchildren, especially, you know, knock wood, if things work out and you build something like Star Wars or Tolkien, Mm -hmm. you want your your kids or your grandkids and your great grandkids to be able to continue on your legacy. And the only way to do that is with a trademark so that, you know, they, they can continue on building upon whatever it is that you've done. And the trademark is a way to guarantee that it stays in the family hands. Otherwise, after the author's gone, your family loses control of it. So that was the primary reason that I went into it. And the way that you do that is get a really good IP attorney, someone who knows what they're doing. You don't want to get your brother, your cousin, you know, family business. You want to make sure that it is a true IP firm who knows what they're doing. Otherwise, you're going to get to a whole basket of trouble. Okay, (laughs) excellent stuff. Now, I'd like to play a game with you, if I may. It's a game we play with authors who have an extensive backlist. uh, And I think you're the author, perhaps, with the most extensive backlist we've interviewed, actually. (laughs) And I want to play a game called Backlist Bingo. And all I need you to do is is pick a number from 1 to 10, and we'll talk about a book from your backlist. So please pick a number from 1 to 10. Uh, Six. Six. Okay, so this is Infinity, number one in the series Chronicles of Nick. This is a YA series, isn't it? How, how did how did this one come about? Actually, I had the idea for doing like the Chronicles of Nick for a long time, mm-hmm. and I, I really couldn't get it through to my publisher because they were. It, it was just so odd. You know, their whole thing was nobody wants to do a book based around a, a teenage series based around a guy. They only wanted girls because in their head teenage boys don't read i was you know yeah they do i promise they do <laughs> you know really they're literate i swear <laughs> you know? and you know and girls will read them based around teenage boys i swear they will yeah. and their whole concept was no only teenage girls read books and the boys go on to other things <laughs> well did you ever think maybe it's because most teenage books are based around heroines mm. But if you wrote a few with male protagonists, they might actually read them. And we went round in these circles forever. 
And my publisher just was uninterested. And then one day my son comes home from middle school and he just, I love my son. He is a true drama king. He, everything's over exaggerated. He throws <laughs> himself down on the floor. He's like, oh, mom, if you don't write me a book soon about zombies, I'm going to lactate. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and at the time he's eleven, I'm like, excuse me. He's like, yes, mom, your son's gonna lactate. <laughs> okay, why? Well, well, I don't want you to do that, child. He's like, well, look at my reading list, mom. I'm telling you right now, we're in trouble because I just can't take it anymore. I need a book with zombies. I need one soon, and somebody has to kill one with a pencil. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I looked at his summer reading list, and sure enough, he was right. Every, they were things like The Midwife's Apprentice. And they were great books. I mean, yeah. there's nothing wrong with them, but he's right. There, there's no zombies in them. And I'm like, okay, baby, I'm going to write you a book with, with zombies. And I called my editor up, and I was like, okay, the time has come. I'm going to do this, and if you don't want it, I'm going to take it somewhere else. And that was how I finally got to do The Chronicles of Nick. So, yeah. Finally, I got him a book with zombies in it. Fantastic. And how was it received? I mean, there's clearly there's tons of books in the series, so it it's clearly was well received. Now you're finding that teenage boys are reading it. Oh, yeah. And the, just like I told them, and the girls, too. I mean, it immediately went to number one. So, yeah, yeah, no, it, it took off like gangbusters. So we were all happy. <laughs> it's like, yes, yeah, son, see? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, pick another number, please. Uh, seven. Seven. I'm being sequential. I don't know why. Ah, now this one is a manga. It's the Dark Hunters Volume 1 uh, in manga form. Now, this is fascinating because you have done comic books as well, but manga is its own particular form. Uh, how did this one come about? I actually went to art school for sequential art, so I've always wanted to do it. And ironically, I did Dark Hunter back in the late 80s. And I, I had pitched it to Dark Horse, I'd pitched it to Marvel, DC, or anybody, IDW, who would let me. Sadly, I must really suck at art. None of them were interested in the graphic novels or any of that. So I never could get it pushed through. And gosh, when was it? Uh, probably about 04, mm -hmm. was it 04, 04, 05, the Dabble brothers were trying to get a hold of me and couldn't ever get through for some reason to my agent. And it was probably about oh five oh six that they finally got through, and we were able to to hook together and come up with the concept for it. So yeah, and I was able to finally finally get them through, and get the books out there. And yeah, they they did an amazing job with them. And what were the the challenges in in working in the manga form? Really, just the only problems that we've ever had, which aren't many, but. The Dabble Brothers, as a rule, are they like the American style, and I, I'm true Japanese. My first love, well, I, you know, I grew up on American comic books, mm -hmm. but my first love will always be Speed Racer. Right. So I love the anime, and I I love especially the Bishonen look, uh -huh. and trying to get that through sometimes. That that was probably it. Where it's like, go back. <laughs> uh -huh. It's a little too much Superman looking, square jawed. No, no, no. Go back. Go back. Awesome. Okay. Pick another number. Uh, two. I got to break the sequence. Okay. Two. Ah, a bit of nonfiction here. The Writer's Guide to Everyday Life in the Middle Ages, the British Isles from 500 to 1500. And you've done a couple of books like this, haven't you? Uh, how did how did this yeah. come about? Um, uh, my love. Oh, my gosh. Basically, Madame de Trugler in the Veganesa. I had to prove to my dad that there was a reason I steeped myself so deeply. I, 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 I'm actually descended from the Plantagenets. So, yeah, wow. I love it. Excellent. And, and yeah. this book came about because of the research you'd done for your own novels and you wanted to share that research or was it, uh, did a publisher come to you? How did it, how did it initially come about? That one they came to me on, I'd actually worked on another book for Writer's Digest, mm -hmm. and they were looking for a writer for that one. And because they knew how heavily steeped I was in the Middle Ages they and how much research I'd been doing on it, at the time I was still in school. So they were, hey, are you interested? Oh, yeah, of course I am. Be more than happy to do it. So fantastic. So the book basically covers things like what people would be wearing, what they would eat, medical and dental care, uh, you know, s music, uh, stuff like that. The kind of detail that that is essential in writing good historical fiction. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's everything that, well, whether you're a role player or you're doing um, Dungeons and Dragons or any of that stuff, so that you'd be able to, um, you'd be able to build upon it and anything that you'd be looking for that, that would be a handy quick reference. So, yes. Superb. Pick another number, please. Uh, let's see. Um, eight. Ah, another nonfiction book, the character naming source book. And this one really fascinated me because this has over 25,000 names and surnames and their meanings. Uh, this started out of a list that you started yourself, wasn't it? Tell us, tell us about that. It actually started when I was very, very small. My grandfather was a linguist of all bizarre things. And so it started out on these car rides. He was also a Baptist preacher which is a strange combination, but it started out on all these car rides going back and forth to church with him where he would you know, strangely um, talk about different words and their meanings. And then we extrapolate to names and where the roots would come from. And I started keeping a list just as a kid because I started, you know, I started writing real tiny. And as I would learn different names and where they came from, I just started writing down different names. So as I was developing my characters, the names just seem to be so important and an integral part of each and every character I was developing. I just wanted my own name. And then by the time I got to high school and we were doing D&D &D stuff, all of my friends were like, oh, my God, Jerry has this amazing list. <laughs> and they all have tell you where the names come from. You've got to look at this. It's better than like the baby books we're using. <laughs> and I started compiling it, breaking it out by the different country and language origins. And by the time I started joining up to different writer groups in my early 20s, everybody was, her thing is so amazing. You've got to see this thing. Look at it. <laughs> and I guess I was probably about 23. And everybody, you got to get it published. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, well, hey, maybe I should be getting this thing published. And it was another project where I, I'd say it took me forever, but really I think I got a contract on it when I was 23 or 24. But to me, it seemed like it took forever to get it published. But yeah, I think I published it when I was 24. So I guess not, but it seemed like a long time. Fantastic. Let's do one more. Pick one more number, please. Um, one. Ah, this is the new book. Stygian, The Dark Hunter World. This is coming out around about the time of recording, about a week from now. It should be available, listeners, when you're listening to this podcast, so go check it out. Tell us about Stygian. Oh, without a spoiler. Okay. <laughs> hmm, that's a little harder. It, it delves deep into the, the villainous side, of the, which is kind of why it's Stygian. It goes, you know, we know all about the good guys. And I've done a little bit, you know, like with One Silent Night where I've looked at the bad guys, but never in any kind of true depth. Like this one does what Asheron and Styx did, where we go back to the very, very beginning of, you know, we start, you know, when Apollo first curses them and you see... Which I'm trying not to so bad not to give spoilers <laughs> and it's really hard where, you know, you wake up at the dawn of the cursing and you see really what they go through where they wake up and here you are, you're normal and you can walk in daylight and suddenly you can no longer eat food and you can't you you're just not normal. I mean, what it really feels like to wake up and be betrayed like that. And to find out that your children are not going to survive and that you're not going to survive and to have everything that you know be ripped out from under you and to learn what it is to be that first generation that's cursed by Apollo and what they go through and to watch, you know, Yuri in, in particular, the main character, walk through all those centuries of watching everything around him just, you know, everybody he loves die. And, you know, he is so steeped in tragedy that, and yet at the same time, he's not really a tragic hero. He, in a weird way, embraces it and how he moves through the centuries with it. It's, and, it, you know, and he has more than one father and he's, he's such an incredibly pivotal and important character. And it's just, yeah. I love him as a character. He's very different from the others and unique to himself. If someone was to start with your books, where would you, if they'd never read any of your books before, where would you direct them to go? 
Uh, well, I would say book one, you can't, you know, that that's an obvious starting point. But Stygian makes actually a really good starting point for Dark Hunter, just because if you know nothing else, it starts really at the very, very beginning. Right. So you get all that history. And, you know, if you know nothing about the universe, you won't be lost because it takes you from really the beginning of Hunter lore. So you will learn everything about it. Um, you know, it's not, and strangely enough, it's not really redundant because you learn histories that you don't know in the other books. Mm -hmm. So it, it w makes a really great entry point if you've not read anything else. But, um, you know, really any of the books, because I write them with the knowledge that people who pick them up may have no knowledge of the series that, when they did so. So anytime I, I do it, I make sure that if I bring up anything to explain it, but I try to always do it in a unique way and to fill in something that you don't know about the other books do you do or that, about the history. Do you do that in the body of the story or do you have a little recap at the beginning? Uh, some some authors, you know, try it one way or the other. Do you, what do you find is more effective? I usually do it in the narrative. So I make it, I try to make it as non-intrusive as possible mm -hmm. that it's part of either the discussion or that it's part of the story itself so that they don't know that they're, and like I said, I always try to make it totally different so that it's adding a new layer to the story so it's always new information or it's the same information but it's told and given to them in a new way and adding another layer to it so that it's like oh 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 or from a new point of view so that when they hear it it seems fresh even though it's not excellent excellent stuff can i go back to what i think is your first published novel correct me if i'm wrong but is it born of night Sort of. Okay. <laughs> it was okay. the first one I sold, but it was not the first one that came out. Okay. Can can you tell us how that came about? Because I, you know, we mentioned earlier, we sort of touched on the fact that yours was not an easy road to publication, and our, our listeners are always fascinated about how people came to be published. But you had you had quite a rocky road to publication, didn't you? How did how did Born of Night yeah. actually come about? Um. Well. <laughs> Yeah, I always say there are two things you don't want to ask me about, publishing and pregnancy, because I'll scare you off of both. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first book I actually, was, well, the first story I had published was actually in 1978, and that was a short story. Uh -huh. The first book I had published was Character Naming Sourcebook, which came out in 92. Right. And the first novel that was published was actually Born of Ice, but I sold Born of Night before I sold Born of Ice. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, my, my publishing career is all wacky. Born of Night, I actually started writing the first version of that, or the original draft was written when I was 12 years old, the, or the prototype for it. It was not very long. It was only 200 pages at 12. Um, but the official draft of what ended up being published was first written when I was 20 years old. And um, right as I finished that first draft of what ended up being published, my older brother died. And um, and I ended up chunking it for a couple of years. Um, so, yeah, actually, if you've read the original version that was published, that is the manuscript I wrote when I was 20 years old. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that was that was hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you if you could go back and talk to young Sherilyn and give her any advice, what would what would you say to her? Oh God, <laughs> right now probably don't get married. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it's that's really bad. My kids were so worth it. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that would probably be it. Uh, in terms of the writing, I'd tell her just to keep going. And what's next for you, Sherilyn? Oh, upwards and onwards always, mm -hmm. you know, over, under, around, or through. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, look, I know you're incredibly busy. Uh, we wish you all the best for Stygian. Uh, folks, we're going to be putting links to uh, Sherilyn's website and some of the books that we talked about in the show notes, so do please check those out. Sherilyn, thank you so much for speaking to me today, and we wish you all the best of luck in the future. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book? Quitting the day job? Becoming a best-selling author? Since 2016, we've interviewed and studied the advice of over 500 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over 1 billion books. 
And in the Best Seller Academy, we've incorporated powerful and proven strategies for success, inspiring fiction and non-fiction authors just like you to reach new heights and write their best book ever. Ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, coaching, and the most inspiring and exclusive community of like-minded writers? Well, your bestseller dreams are just a click away. Join us today at bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. What an amazing interview and what an amazing woman, Mark. Yeah, she is fantastic. And uh, I think the big lesson, and we've heard this before, we have heard this before, is as she said towards the end, keep going. You know, it's the people who give up who fall by the wayside. She kept going. And, you know, despite all the ups and downs in her life, she's kept going and is uh, an incredible person. And, you know, she's uh, she's still doing it. And uh, she's, you know, got this new book, Stygian, which has just come out. Do check out her website as well. It is the slickest author website I have ever seen. And that speaks to her background in coding and working for the military, <laughs> you know, the, mm. the Internet before it was the Internet. So she clearly knows her stuff there. But um, it is the most I, I love websites that have a countdown to a publication as well. So her next book, I'm looking at a website now at Death Store, 210 days, three hours, five minutes, 26, 25, 24 seconds. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's really, huge, really though, Mark. It's mm, huge yeah. because we and weirdly enough, we did exactly the same thing with Jen's book. We had mm. we gave ourselves a deadline of six days. And right on the front page and right on the order page, we've got this massive clock counting down. And it's like on the, on Facebook now, people are actually like, they keep checking in with it. They keep checking in with the clock and the, the percentage that we've reached funding. And if you actually want to understand the background to why it works, I mean, we see it all around us in the fact that these are continuous sales that shops keep having, you know, closing down this weekend or you know, the bed shops and carpet shops are brilliant. But there is a thing called scarcity value and it's it makes us act. It makes us act now because the hardest thing to sell a book is actually make people get people to make a purchasing decision at that point. And the countdown clock gives a sense of, um, a deadline. And we all, we've talked about this just from a writing perspective. We all work better when we have a deadline. And the two of us know that more than most based on our experiences back to reality you set a deadline. Absolutely. And it, it's just, it just works. So yeah. Uh, Authors, if you want to write your book, have a massive countdown. There's actually an app you can download um, and you can have a massive countdown clock on your screen, on your desktop or on app. And, and whatever it is to write your book, whether it's 30 days or a year, set that clock today and have it counting down and send us a picture of it because it, it works. It, it creates a bit of pressure. It's like the who wants to be a millionaire kind of you know, countdown. It, it, it creates tension and the music starts getting more and more kind of intense and something about it just wires you into actually completing stuff so it really works hmm. i should have tried that when i was fundraising for the end of magic but i, I might do that when ah, when um when we officially announced a publication date so i might, I might give that absolutely a go so yeah yeah, yeah that sounds cool great stuff. and you can also set targets like if you want to count down to sell your first thousand copies of your book then then set a target set a month to do it or two weeks or whatever and have a countdown and it just makes people want to contribute towards hitting that otherwise it's just open-ended and it's like a manana kind of scenario where you just wait and you do it later yes yeah we all know about that so yeah, yeah. absolutely uh, big thanks to everyone who's uh, been in touch on social media uh we've had some wonderful news from some of our listeners and a former guest now you must remember uh, Katrina Innes, who was on oh, episode yes. 86. Uh, she was senior editor of Cosmopolitan. Yeah, fantastic. Well, she's only gone and got a book deal. Um, she no tweeted way. just the other day. Yes way. She said, Amazing. big news, I've... I have a book coming out next year. Absolutely so delighted to be working with Katie Brown at the Trapeze Books team. Uh, now, Trapeze is um, Sam Eads's uh, imprint that she works on. So, And she works with Katie Brown there. So, I don't know. Did, did we have something to do with I that? I wonder. Think, uh... Well, maybe we should find <laughs> out. Because Sam was on our show. She was one of the very first guests. Sam's amazing. Mm -hmm. She was on episode yeah. two, I think, or three. Yeah, yeah, something and, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we had... When, when, when did we have... Katrina, was it? In, it was episode 86. Series? So it 86. was, it was, um, 
Yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a way in, but um, it's just fantastic news for. Control. I mean, we'll take credit for it, obviously. Of course, obviously. we will. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, sorry, this, it's sorry, it's, it's a huge. Well, I but I remember in our interview where we where we chatted with her, it was fascinating about you know how she was she was spending all of her time interviewing other people and deep down i think she even said it didn't she on the show that she you know that was the dream and there it is boom yeah she, she she says it in a tweet uh, I, it's thrown around a lot but this really is my dream come true the book is called the matchmaker a fresh take on dating and love exploring grief loneliness and friendship so wow. fantastic news katrina uh keep us posted maybe we could speak to you again about the book with closer to publication i think that would be fun yeah so fantastic fantastic well news done, from katrina. katrina thank you now, for tweeting it out now you remember last week you had logan offering uh he asked you to do his uh, theme tune for his podcast and he was offering yes. uh ribs well he's uh, he's come back and said look i'm serious about this uh, <laughs> f- uh fancy hank's barbecue well, is accommodating to all creeds just just look at this and tell me you ain't hungry now now fancy hank's i'm gonna i'm just gonna send you the link for this, this a new sponsor for the podcast out. mark fancy uh, hanks. it could be with it, a name like that be. i think they should come and join yeah. us yeah, well, it's the writing, the official eating, <laughs> the, the official meal of the bestseller experiment. I've just sent you their Instagram. Have a look because uh, okay. that's for their... people that missed this last week, this is somebody who'd like found out that I did the actual music for our podcast and was wondering if I could do the music for their podcast. But it does actually involve me flying potentially to pick up my mm. reward to Australia, <laughs> which, which I mean, it would just be a brilliant opportunity to go and visit Australia. So I'm just going to go and look yeah. at this, this Instagram. Yeah. This so so I, f- fancy Hanks, his prime uh, ribs. Or? Yeah. They say they're the best slow cooked barbecue in Melbourne. Now oh, I've got a friend who's just, that. m- that's good. That's good. Eating, it's dripping. It's good like pulled eating. pork yeah. dripping out of a bun. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It's oh, nice stuff. No. I've, uh, my friend uh, Darren has just moved back to Melbourne. So, Darren, if you want to pop into Fancy Hanks, let us know what it's like. Then maybe maybe we've got a deal. Anyway, we'll see. So, thanks, Logan. It's <laughs> great. Uh, um, you might be waiting a while for the podcast music, but you know, uh, when I'm next in Australia, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll drop by and, and give you the MP3. And uh, you remember we had a tweet from Bethany talking about uh, listening to the podcast while she's cleaning the cadaver lab. And I asked for a photo. Well, she didn't send us anything bloody she 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 said my not so secret identity has been exposed by day i'm a mild-mannered historical romance writer by night i put on rubber gloves grab a mop bucket and become a janitor so i said where's all the blood and gore bethany and she sent a photo of her sort of gloved hand on on the mop and then another hand writing but no blood and gore and she says well she's obviously already cleaned it all up (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she said, it is not my habit to keep work pictures of gore on my phone. I figured fair enough. Yeah, that could be kind of calls for dismissal, couldn't it, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> That's so brilliant, though. That that to me sounds like just a brilliant opening chapter in a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. It's like misery totally. meets um, six feet under, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Um, We've had a, a bit of follow-up on a public declaration. Now, a friend of the podcast, Richie Unikowitz, I got it right. I think I well got done. that right. Um, he A while ago, he uh, he blogged about his forthcoming book, uh, Warpath, uh, which is a cracking-looking cyberpunk book. And he blogged about it. He said, I announced on social media I was going to write, edit, and finish the entire novel in three months. November 7th, 2018 is my self-imposed deadline. As I'm writing this, it's October 16th, which means I haven't got long to tidy Warpath up and make sure it's ready to go live when I said it would be. I've taken a week off work, a real gamble when you're self-employed to wow. put the Hudson, and that's a main character Hudson's story to bed as a stay and go I fully intend to meet my target and get Warpath out into the world in November so Richie we've got everything crossed for you man uh, go Richie it, yeah if you want to check out it's richieunikowitz.com I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes the other thing you want to check out and he's just done this tonight he's done this thing on Instagram right he's got an amazing bit of cover art for it fantastic I cover saw art. it posted up just before we came on air I love it really love yeah it's fantastic it's it's well it's he's done that thing on instagram where you post you sort of divvy the cover up into 12 squares and then you post each square in order on instagram and when you look at his page it's the whole cover 
Does that make sense? Fantastic. Yes. Clever. It looks really, it looks really, really good. And so what you're getting, if you're following them on Instagram, you're getting like, there's the feet, there's a sky rise, there's a bit of the shout line and the shout line is fire when ready. So you see these words crop up and you're thinking, well, what's this? What's this? It's really good at hooking you in. So congrats on that, Richie. Uh, We've got everything crossed for you, man. Hope it all works on time and if anyone out there has a public declaration let us know we're just coming up to NaNoWriMo is anyone getting ready for NaNoWriMo if you are tell us uh, and we'll be there cheerleading and uh, we want you to hit those targets absolutely and we have had a few people already drop us a note about them we will give them a shout out closer to NaNoWriMo which starts really in just over a week when this goes out won't so it's not long in fact just a tip for everyone who missed our NaNoWriMo or as I like to call it now Nano write a lotto because <laughs> it's not really about rhyming, is it? Right. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, but I, I think it's really important, and the people, a lot of people miss this. They don't plan for it. You know, they get to like Halloween and they're scared. You know, obviously because of the time of year into doing NaNoWriMo the next day. And and I see that people that don't succeed are the people that kind of think about it a day before. So. When you listen to this podcast, first, if you don't know what it is, go find out what it is, because it's a brilliant way of getting a really productive month of writing done. It's a breakthrough for huge amounts of people that we know. But secondly, it's about having a bit of a think this week as to what you actually want to achieve. Don't just go into it saying, I must write a 50,000 words. It's actually, well, what, what do you actually want to get by the end of it? And the more thought you put up front, they say actually from coaching, they say like every hour you spend planning is like 100 hours gained in productivity. So spend this week having a dwell on what it is you want to get out of it and then hit the ground running, have your plan, work out when you're going to write each day, have a schedule, get up early if that's what it takes to do, like do a John Grisham. Do you know the John Grisham story, Mark? No. John Grisham started, he was a a lawyer, surprise, surprise, when you listen to Rudy's books, but he, when he wanted to become an author, he was like a top lawyer in, in a ridiculously busy job and he decided to basically get up half an hour earlier each morning before he went into work. And that's how he wrote his first book. And that's how it all started. So if you're thinking, I haven't got the time to write, you do. It's just you have to kind of go to bed half an hour earlier and get up half an hour early if that's possible. Um, But plan, 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 and you will have massive success. I I met John Grisham once. Did you? What's he like? Is he a nice guy? (laughs) I really wanted to dislike him. Um, because this was at the time. <laughs> what, because he sold like a million books or something? Uh, 10 no, million, no, this, this was books. at the time of um, Oliver Stone's movie, and I've forgotten the name of it now. Not the two. Uh, no, no, it was, um, oh, God, the really violent one. That uh, And some people went on a killing spree and said that they were inspired oh, by the movie to I kill people. That. Yeah. yeah, and and Grisham came out and and spoke out against it. So I was kind of yeah, and I met him, and he's the most charming man you could ever meet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he it was a, a premiere, a preview screening of uh, A Time to Kill, the Matthew McConaughey film. Right. And he came along, and he he did a speech at the beginning. He shook everyone's hand. He and he did that thing of you know shook you, your hand, looked you right in the eye. He yeah. really pressed the flesh that evening. He was a consummate professional, and uh, uh, it was Natural Born Killers. That's the film. Oh uh, goodness, yes, I remember that movie. Yeah, Woody yeah. Harrelson, wasn't it? With shaven head. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, I remember yeah. watching that in the, in the cinema. And of course, yeah, when, you, when you disturbing. look at it. Well, when you look at it now, it's daytime telly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's very true, actually. That's crazy. But folks, if, you, if you're going to jump into NaNoWriMo, as part of your preparation, listen to episodes five, eight, and 10 of the podcast. Uh, episodes five and eight, we speak to Grant Faulkner, one of the uh, the founders of... He's of the main NaNo. man. He's exec- yeah. executive He's director of top, NaNoWriMo. Top He's got... All sorts of tips there. Episode 10, we spoke to the wonderful Robin Stevens, who uh, has uh, the fantastic Murder Most Unladylike mystery books. And she, uh, she that all started with NaNoWriMo for her. So if you want to get some inspiration, episode 10. That's just a wonderful, mm. wonderful story. And there's so many actual stories of people who started their writing career with NaNoWriMo, um, who went on to become hugely successful authors. There's a whole list actually online. Um, in fact, I, I remember that uh, Grant talked a lot about about those people because they are the shining lights. You know, they're the inspiration as to I mean, what can happen when you just just take that first step. 
So yeah. good luck, Maybe everyone, we, if you're doing it. And drop us we a hear note. it again and again, again and again. It's just fantastic. And that's it, I think. Just a quick plug. Um, if you're listening to this on the Monday that it's released, uh, this will be just as we're coming up to Halloween. So on Halloween, <laughs> we have a Halloween special with the horror legend Ramsey Campbell. Ramsey Campbell, I'll just give you a quick introduction. He has been writing horror now for something like 60 plus years uh he's been writing since he was a teenager much longer than that young whippersnapper mr stephen king yeah. so what he doesn't know about horror isn't worth knowing so we've got a horror halloween special ramsey campbell 31st of october check it out subscribe rate and review cha 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 <laughs> That's enough to scare people in itself, Mark. <laughs> That's brilliant. I do love that jingle, though. That's a pretty amazing coup, isn't it, to um, yeah. to get Ramsey on the show. So do do check that out and um, join yeah. us for a bit of um, Halloween fun. We'll say no more. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us this week. And remember to subscribe, rate and review. Please give us a review on iTunes. It kind of bumps up some weird algorithm thingy and we get spread out a bit more, which is always good. Um, same idea of seen hobnobs really um but the the other thing that i was going to suggest is pop over to facebook pop over to twitter and pop over to instagram search for bestseller experiment and do come and drop us a note we do read every email we get you can contact us directly via the messaging uh, options on those on those different uh, sites but also you can just come straight to bestsellerexperiment.com click on the contact us button and uh, there's just so much stuff on our website now I, I mean this is two years in i think actually virtual high five mr stay we made it to two years yeah hey! two years Whee! that's pretty crazy isn't it two years who would have thought that little conversation we had two and a bit years oh, no. ago where it's like what's that you doing what should we do a podcast what should we do it about and here we are still friends still chatting two years later through some of the most incredible experiences really when you look at it i mean and um so i think we officially start season three with yeah. with our halloween special because we do an annual kind of season so that's it folks for season two we, we weren't even sure if we'd get through season one, but we're still here. I'm afraid you can't get rid of us that easily. Um, stop buying our book, by the way, um, Back to Reality. If you stop buying our book, that will definitely get rid of us. Right, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we do spoil you, don't we? And if you do feel spoiled, you can spoil us by popping over to Patreon. Um, come to uh, patreon.com forward slash bestseller experiment and subscribe and support this podcast. Help us cover our costs with it and help this podcast to keep going. Every penny counts, folks, and you will get rewarded just unboundedly. Right, Mark, with all these amazing things that we've got. So if that's even a word, but um, do join us. Patreon.com forward slash bestseller experiment. If you've been thinking about doing it and you haven't done it yet, now is the time please, please, please go to that website and support our podcast. Thank you so much. This is the end of this public announcement. <laughs> so, yes. so it's a goodbye from Mark 1. And a goodbye from Mark 2. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>